In this lecture, we're going to talk about how you should approach practice questions, which really is how you will succeed on the exam. You need the knowledge, you need to be able to explain it, then you need to be able to deconstruct the questions, what are they actually asking here? From that, using the knowledge, what is the most right answer in this scenario? And then finally, time management. When I talk to students who fail the exam, it is most often because they use practice questions wrong. They say, I took a test, I scored 70%, then I took another test, which is the completely wrong way to do it. If you just take another test and another test, you don't learn anything new. You're not going to progress. It's not just grind out questions. It is take a test, everything you're not completely sure on, mark it for review, and then at the end of the test, Everything that you had marked for review and everything you got wrong, you restudy those areas. And you don't do another practice test until you have restudied them. You are completely clear on why you got that question wrong. You are able to explain the concepts. Then, and only then, do you move on to the next test. You have actually expanded your knowledge. And on the next test, you're going to do better in those areas. And remember, don't reuse practice questions. If you take a test now, you score, let's say, 70%, and then you retake it in two days, then you might score 80%. It is very likely that you're scoring 80% because you remember some of the questions. So use each set of questions only once. This is also an English test as well as a cybersecurity test. Answer all the questions with exactly what they ask for. Answer it like a lawyer. And what I mean by that is lawyers answer exactly what they are asked. They don't read into questions. They don't try to interpret. You ask them a question, they give you the exact answer. And you need to train yourself to do this because this is one of the biggest problems people have on the exam. They either read into the question, try to answer more than they're actually being asked, or they're used to doing stuff. This happens, then I want to respond with this. And also remember, this is the perfect world of IC squared. It's rainbows and unicorns. We have enough time, we have enough money to implement the right solution. And the right solution is not the most expensive, it is the appropriate solution for whatever we are protecting. We have the right top-down leadership and we do everything right. This is most likely not the world you live in and work in every day, but for the exam, answer from that point of view. Now, let's talk about how to approach the actual questions. Read the entire question. Take the time you need to completely read it, probably read it twice, and then deconstruct it. What are they really asking? You need to find the keywords and you need to find the indicators. Indicators are most, best, least, can, always, and then the keywords is what is this question actually about. That could be PKI or self-directed or something like that. And when I say deconstruct, boil it down to its essence. It might be a full paragraph of a question, but really what they're asking is the last 10 words. If we look at this question, Jane is the lead of our incidents response team. They have proof hackers have gained access to some of our systems and they have successfully altered some of our customer information. Jane reports this to Bob, the IT security manager, who should Bob notify first? Not a super long question, but there's still a ton of fluff. The fact that Jane is the lead of our incidents response team eh, doesn't really matter. That we have proof does. Hackers have gained access to some of our systems. The fact that Jane reports it to Bob, eh, who should Bob notify first? So really, the question is, we have been attacked. They have compromised us. Who do we notify first? That's it. Then we look at the answer options. The data owner, the regulatory agencies that govern our sector, the IT security steering committee, or the customers who are compromised. Now, very likely, we would talk to all of those. We would inform them at some point. The question is, first, would we notify the data owner? I would say probably. How about the agency that governs our sector? No, we have to notify them, but they're definitely not first. The IT security steering committee. Again, no. We do need to notify them, but the data owner needs to know first. And then finally, the customers. Maybe, I don't know. It depends on the laws, the regulations, how bad the breach was, and many other things. Now, I have heard from many students that use different techniques to make this better. 
Some read the question once, then look at the answer options, and then pick the best answer. Others read the answers first. These are the four options I have. Then they read the question, and they kind of have it in the back of their mind. These are the options. Regardless of how you do it, I suggest reading the question at least once, preferably twice. Deconstruct it. Figure out what are they actually asking, and then go through the answer options and argue with yourself. Sure, we need to let the IT security steering committee know, but do we do that first? No, we don't. We let the data owner know, and so on. Does the answer option that you pick meet all the requirements that the question poses? We need to be both accurate and precise. Here, they're probably all right answers, but what is the most right answer? In this specific question, you have four possible right answers, but in many questions, you have two possible right answers and you have two distractors. That means that you can eliminate one, maybe two of the answer options. Some of them can be just completely they don't match. They ask about something in the OSI model, and two of the answers have to do with fire suppression and PKI. Those are easy to eliminate. Some of them will also list things that we do. But in the wrong order or not appropriate in this situation. So let's say you have a question and you're like, I think this is the answer, but it could also be this. Well, then look through the last options. If you have no clue and you're not sure on any of the four, well, then you have 25 percent. If you can eliminate two of them, now you have 50 percent chance of getting it right. Then you do the internal dialogue. You argue this is a better answer because of this. And once you have gone through that, it is most likely the right answer. Another way you could think through the question is: If we can only implement or do one thing, what would best solve the problem? In this case, if you can only notify one thing, one person, one agency, one whatever, which one should you choose? Again, we get the same answer: the data owner. But it can, in some cases, help you to argue with yourself: This is a better answer because if I can only pick one. Then I would choose this. And now that we have talked about how to approach the questions, let's finish this lecture out with talking about some more practical stuff. It is perfectly normal when you start to score somewhere around 60 percent. Perfectly normal. It is what you should expect because you're just starting out. Even if you score 50 percent, it really doesn't matter. Those are just numbers. Now, what you do after the test is really what matters. This is where you restudy. You look at all the questions you had marked for review and all the questions you got wrong. Then you restudy those areas until you can explain what it is, where we use it, how we use it, why we use it, and when we use it. And since most people don't have someone they can talk to, talking to yourself works just as fine. Explain the concept, all the intricacies, because when you're able to explain something, you actually understand it. Now, as you do more questions, you restudy more. You're obviously going to do better. Now, when are you ready for the exam? It is likely that you can pass the exam just by doing this course and all the practice questions. But I would suggest scoring 80 to 85 percent before testing. You do also at some point have to start looking at time management for the test engines where they have that timer. Keep an eye on it and maybe set a page saying, "At 50 questions, I should have spent an hour." At a hundred, two hours, because I have talked to so many students that say I spent too much time on the first fifty questions, and then at some point I just started skimming over the question, answering really quickly, and clicking next. Which at that point is completely fair. You have to do that. But if at all possible, let's not get to that point. Let's learn the time management before you get to the exam, and then when you sit in the exam and you can see you're in question forty-two. But you spent an hour and ten minutes already. You're seventy-five percent sure that this is probably the right answer. Well, then choose that answer and move on. And once you move on, once you click next, completely forget the question you just answered. You can't go back and change the answer, so put it out of your mind. It's not going to help anything if you keep obsessing about that one. And then let's talk about breaks. Take them when you need them, and preferably take them before you need them. So, in your studying, do at least one or two full 100 question practice tests, so you know if your mind will stay clear enough after question number 80 or 85. If your brain stops braining at some point, know when that is. Let's say at one hour and 15 minutes. 
at one hour and 15, I'm just going to start staring blankly at the screen. I'm going to read the same question five times and I still don't understand it. So if you know at one hour and 15 minutes ish, I hit the wall, we'll maybe take a break at one hour. Either just close your eyes for 20 seconds, meditate, do whatever you can, or get up, walk around, go to the bathroom. If possible, eat some sugar, drink some caffeine, and then get back to the test. The test does not stop. If you take a 10-minute break, you have 10 minutes less for the exam. If you take half an hour, well then, half an hour. That said, I still think they're a good idea. Reset your mind and back to the exam. And do as much of this as you can when you take practice tests to emulate what would actually happen on the exam. Do the full test. Lock yourself in a room. Take the breaks, but don't let anything else distract you. Because if you just do 20 questions here and 20 questions there, you don't know how your brain is going to react when you hit question number 80 or 90. I hope all of this has helped you demystify the exams, help you figure out how to approach questions, and how you can most effectively and efficiently prepare for your test and pass your exam. And with that, we're done with this lecture. I will see you in the next one.